morning, CV Church. I welcome you back home like I do every week. If you are a guest this morning, we're thrilled that you are here. We are a multicultural and a, an intergenerational church. And today is a very exciting day for us because it is our annual vision day. You're going to hear what God has done over the last two years, what we believe he wants to do in and through us for the remainder of this year and through 2018. Our theme today is Together as One. I'm hearing people say lately that what is going on in our country, in our state, and in many people's lives is division. That our country and relationships are being torn apart. But it does not have to be this way. The Bible has some very strong things to say about division, about harmony and unity. Would you please read out loud with me Psalms 133, 1 to 3. It's on the uh, screen. Let's begin. How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew of Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. There the Lord has pronounced his blessings, being in life everlasting. This psalm is known as an ascent psalm because David wrote it. His Israelites all over the country and the world would come and ascend up to the Temple Mount to worship God together. And David was overcome with an incredible sight of seeing all his brothers and all his sisters descending on Jerusalem to celebrate their God. This was a moving sight as David watched all of them together. They have come as one to worship, to adore, and to praise God their Father. He delighted in the unity and the joy and the togetherness he was seeing as they came from all over. David states that harmony unity and people loving each other is pleasant, it's precious, and it's delightful. The feelings that come from harmony and unity are love and joy, excitement, and anticipation of what God will do and will do as we commit personally to guard and protect and fight for our unity together. Unfortunately, all of us know this, harmony is not always found in the church as God wants it to be. Harmony isn't found in our relationships as husband and wife and children and extended family as much as we would really like it to be. And believe it or not, church, I have witnessed in my 30 years of being a lead pastor, there are some people who actually delight in causing tension and discrediting others. They have this kind of warped need to stir the pot wherever they go. But God says to us that unity and harmony and learning to live together as one people is important for three basic reasons. One, it causes the church to become a positive example to the world, and it helps draw others to the Lord. Our unity, our care, our sacrifice, our love for each other. Number two, it helps us cooperate as a body of believers, as God meant us to, giving us a foretaste of heaven. And number three, it revitalizes ministries because there's less tension to sap our energy. Have you ever thought about just how your interpersonal relationships and the tension that can be stirred up because of them, they, sometimes they just leave you drained, well, David uses two examples of a local church that lives together in unity and harmony and why it is so wonderful and so pleasing. The first is David likens the unity and the preciousness of harmony to the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head. What does that mean to us? The anointing oil is symbolized as the unity of the nation as they worship God under the Holy Spirit's leadership through their spiritual leader. The anointing oil symbolized that Aaron was set apart. He was dedicated. Another word, 
He was consecrated and dedicated by God to lead them. It was their unity in following the leadership of Aaron and David that God appointed leaders, and then he set them apart to worship God, and it set them apart to God themselves. Friends, when we give ourselves to Jesus and to spirit-led leadership, it creates an atmosphere where God can do miracles in our midst. This is what the anointing oil stands for. It is a symbol of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, and he wants to do miracles in our lives. But he can't use you and I to the degree that he wants to wherever there is dissension, there is anger, there is unforgiveness, there is gossip, and there is deceit. The second example that David uses of the power of harmony and unity among the local church is the dew from Mount Hermon. It was one of the largest, if not the largest, mountain in Israel. The dew of heaven, of, of Hermon, was heavy. And it symbolizes how refreshing and how invigorating unity and harmony are. As we contend to live out our lives together as one, and can I underscore that word? You have to contend. You have to make up your mind when your feet hit the bed, I hit the floor in the morning, I am going to contend for unity. I am going to contend for harmony within my family, within my friends, within my culture, and within my church. If you don't give yourself to it, it will not happen. Does that make sense? There is this myth that we just think you, you surrender your life to Christ and relationships should just go automatic and should just be fine. The problem with that is we have an enemy of our soul and his name is Satan. We've just gone through the book of Revelation. He's called the liar. He's called the dragon. He's called the serpent. He's called the accuser of the brethren. He's called the separator of the brethren. When you get into dogfights with your spouse and your children, you can just bet that there is some kind of evil turbocharging behind that because he is bent on destroying our relationships. Does this make sense to you? There's a myth that thinks that love just comes natural. Love doesn't come natural to any of us in this room. What comes natural is we're selfish. What comes natural is we're arrogant. What comes natural is that we're proud. Love is something that can only be birthed by the Holy Spirit, and then you and I have to act on it. As, as we continue to live our lives together as one, it creates this kind of environment for true growth to take place Spiritually, emotionally, relationally, and numerically. Division, arguments, gossip, bad attitudes impede and can stop growth. But harmony, unity, and working together leads to healthy, vital growth. This blows me away when Jesus, in his prayer for unity, listen to what he says in John 17, 21, and 23. He's praying. It's called the priestly prayer. I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one, as you're in me, Father, and I am in you. And notice what he says. Here's the purpose for this unity. And may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. In other words, when we work in harmony, when we work in unity, when we are actively forgiving one another, when the world sees that we're sacrificing our lives on behalf of each other, Jesus has the audacity to say, by seeing how you love, by seeing how you contend for the unity of the faith, they're going to believe that I have been sent by God. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Oh, that's unbelievable. So dissension causes the world to believe that Jesus doesn't exist. When the church splits over color of carpet and whether we're singing the right songs that tickle people's fancies and all the stupid things that churches have divided for, it does just the opposite of what Jesus was praying for. May they experience such perfect unity 
that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. I'm kind of loud, aren't I, this morning? <laughs> this is really important. When it's important, I seem to get louder. My wife will say to me, do you think by yelling I'm going to hear you better? You can quiet down, but I kind of got it in me today, so please forgive me. Church, this should take our breath away. Jesus' prayer for his disciples and for us and our love for Jesus and for each other would experience that same kind of oneness that Jesus experienced with the Father for the purpose that our unity with Jesus and each other would be proof to the world that the Father sent Jesus to the world. One of my favorite New Testament scholars is Craig Keener, and he says this about these two verses. The way believers treat one another, now this will boggle your mind, is essential component for proclaiming Jesus to the world. In other words, if we're trying to win people to Christ and we are in dissent and we are talking bad about each other and we can't come to an agreement, we are interfering with the proclamation of the gospel. If one compares this prayer with Jesus' early prayer in John eleven forty two, one finds that the unity of believers provide the same kind of witness concerning Jesus' origin as Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Now, because we're a Pentecostal charismatic church, I'll hear people say, we well, need to see more miracles. And I, I agree. I agree. One of the miracles we need to see is the miracle of unity in our midst where we're sacrificing on each other's behalf. We're preferring one another. We're loving one another. Did you know there's 59 one another's in the New Testament? Love one another. Be gracious to one another. Forgive one another. Accept one another. Serve one another. It says when you're living out the gospel in your actual attitudes towards each other, which means there's no place for us to judge one another and to condemn one another and to be unforgiving each other. That takes away from the power of the gospel. The leading characteristic of a life-giving, growing church is the commitments each of us make. The next statement is one of our leading statements being a purpose-driven church. Would you read this out loud with me? Here we go. A great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. What's the great commandment? What's the great commission? Matthew 22, 36 to 40. Uh, a scribe comes up to Jesus and says, Teacher, what's the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Here's a shocker. You would think that he would stop there, wouldn't you? Shouldn't that be enough? It should just stand alone there. Notice what he says. The second is equally important. Newsflash, love your neighbor as yourself. So this thing about, well, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to be in a small group. I don't need to be a part of the body of Christ. Jesus says, what book are you reading? Because he says, the book I read, the Old Testament, which he also had a part in writing because he inspired it. He says, you love God and you must love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law demands on the of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So in other words, I'm only in self-deception. If I continue to be bitter and angry and unforgiving and manipulative and hold things over people, my love for Jesus Christ does not come out of a wholehearted commitment. That's what the cross is all about. Those two beings point to loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. Then what is the Great Commission? Jesus comes and he told his disciples, this is after he was raised from the dead and now he's beginning to ascend to the Father. He says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, you go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I love this. 
I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, making the commitment to order your life around God's five purposes for your life is how you actually become a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus says you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the purpose of worship. Slide, please. This is the purpose of worship. Worship is you were planned for God's pleasure. Where do we get that? Ephesians 1.5 says this. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Notice what it says. This is what he always wanted to do, and it has given him great pleasure. God created the idea of family. He loves you. He wants you to be a part. This is called worship. Our second purpose is ministry. What's ministry? You were shaped for serving. Jesus said the second commandment is equally important to the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. Church, this is amazing. You would think that loving God should stand alone. But Jesus said loving your neighbor is as important as loving God. In other words, Jesus says you cannot truly love God without loving others. Look at this in 1 John 3, 16 to 19. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up, gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. As the Savior goes, so we should go. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? In other words, you see a need in non-action, there's a problem there. You've heard me say this before. It's oxymoron for me to think that I can respond to the Savior's love and sacrifice for me and come be a part of the church and simply take and not give. It doesn't exist. A true Christian is somebody who receives and gives, receives and gives, receives and gives. One of the problems happens is when you're not receiving from Jesus Christ and you continue to give, that's when it gets ugly. That's when it gets stinky because that's not God's power flowing through me anymore. I'm doing it out of obligation. Our actions, notice this, our actions, our behaviors, our decisions will show that we belong to the truth so that we will be confident when we stand before God. Our third purpose is evangelism. This is what we believe is you were made for mission. Jesus tells us in the Great Commission, I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Now you go. The reason I've been given all authority and I've been given all power is so that you can go and make disciples. In other words, friends, once you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you are to be on mission 24-7. Every person you meet by how you respect and value them, you can be building a bridge to one day share the good news with them. Uh, the little ongoing saga of Tanya, who I met in Costco five, six months ago. You guys, hey, Rick, are you there? No, no. fantastic. <laughs> She took out membership last week. Now she wants to follow and get baptized. And this came out of an encounter at Costco. Nothing spiritual at Costco. <laughs> Unless wherever you go, you're on mission. Right? Our fourth purpose is fellowship. You were formed for God's family. I'm going to close my time with that in a few moments and speak more in depth as we live our lives out together as one. Our fifth purpose is discipleship. You were created to become like Christ. He tells us, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this, I'm with you always to the end of the age. As we each choose to live out this great commitment... Because it's a choice you have to make. And great commandment and great commission, 
God wants to grow a great church together through each one of us. So I want to close by focusing on the purpose of fellowship, which is practiced through becoming a member of this local church. How can you make sure that you're living your life in harmony, in unity, together with your CV church family? I lost my way. You didn't lose your way. You lost your calling. That's what you did. The mission changes. Your commitment is never meant to waver. Jesus Christ is very similar to the military of the United States. He's looking for a few good, committed men and women who will say, I'm willing to lay my life down for the gospel's sake. The mission will change. Goals will change. Expectations will change. But you must never lose your calling. I see people get hurt. I see them, their emotions get infected and they go, Pastor, I'm leaving. You hurt me. Well, can we work it out? No, I'm leaving. You've lost and left your calling. Listen, I could have left here many times. I have felt so broken at times. I felt so in fear. I have felt so incapable. And I remember Jesus just simply said to me one day, I don't care how bad you feel. I called you here. You're not done until I'm done with you. And I will tell you when I'm done. Loved ones, you don't have the right to do what you want to do. You have been called. You have been appointed. You have been anointed by Jesus Christ. And he says, don't ever turn your back on the calling. Don't ever turn your back on me. Don't ever turn your back on the body of Christ. So four things about commitment. Look at point number one. These are commitments that we ask people to make going through 101. And I felt like I just need to come back and I need to rehearse this with you. Why? Well, we thought this was vision day. Yeah, it is. This is vision about your commitment to Christ and then his people. Are you committed? Will you die for the gospel? Will you die for his body? Will you sacrifice for the gospel? Will you sacrifice for his body? Look at uh, number one. Commit to protecting the unity of my CV church. How? Just real quickly. A, by acting in love towards other members. What that means is when we gather in small group, when we gather here, please don't just vote for your car. Oh, boy, that, I ate good today. Oh, man, I'm blessed. I'm going home. No. Who do you need to connect with here? Who is hurting and broken? What really got me there is when he said, you left your post and we were broken. And part of the reason we were broken is we looked to you to be there and you copped out, Commander. That kind of stuff stirs my soul. Doesn't it yours? Yes. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> First Peter 1.22 says, You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. Act in love towards others. Letter B, how do we protect the unity? By refusing to gossip. Nothing creates more confusion and division and suspicion than gossiping and slandering other people in our church family. Proverbs 11:13 says, "A gossip goes around telling secrets, but those who are get this, trustworthy. When you gossip, you are not trustworthy. When you gossip, when you slander, when you talk about somebody else and they're not there, you're not being faithful. You are trustworthy. You can keep a confidence. Proverbs 20, 19. A gossip goes around telling secrets, so don't hang around chatterers. C, how do you protect the unity? By partnering in the vision, mission, and leadership of CV Church. You do this by committing wholeheartedly to God's five purposes for you personally and for our church. If you haven't taken out membership yet, I encourage you to sign up for our next Life Development 101. It's in November. Get around the basis. 101, 201, 301, 401. This is our Life Development Seminar on Membership, Maturity, Ministry, and Mission. 
And I have people say, well, can't I just pick the ones I want? No. No. We have them in order for a reason. I mean, I'm not as stupid as I look. <laughs> Membership is commitment to Jesus and to this church. Many people want to, well, I just want to skip all that and go to finding my God-given shape. Well, bless your little sweet selfish heart. Of course you do. <laughs> but letter B is about spiritual maturity. I'm, what kind of servant am I if my roots aren't deep in Jesus Christ? Does that make sense? Yes. My servanthood towards you needs to be just ensconced in the word of God and the Holy Spirit and prayer and fasting where I'm tending my soul and allowing Jesus to shape me because how he shapes you impacts how you serve. Have you ever had somebody who's a waiter and they throw their food at you? Boy, that's incongruent, isn't it? Letter D, by going to the person I have a problem with in private, I find this is the most difficult thing for this church, and I think for anybody. It's much easier for me to talk to Tommy about Jeff than just go to Jeff. Right? Come on, right? Yes. It is. Oh, I'd be, I'd be afraid to go talk right to Jeff. Oh, but there's no fear about slandering his name to Tommy? Are you kidding me? Wow. Number two, I commit to sharing the responsibility of my CV church. How do I do that? Letter A, by praying for its growth. How do I do that? Use the surf VIP paradigm. If you're a guest with us, surf VIP is S-E-R-F-V-I-P, and it stands for Pray for your CV church family, spiritual growth, emotional growth, relational growth, financial growth, our vocational growth, our intellectual growth, growth, our physical growth, and yes, our numerical growth. Pray for growth. Letter B, by inviting the unchurched to attend. There's two kinds of unchurched people. There are people who call themselves Christians, but they're not a part of the local church. Listen, you, you're not going to grow in your relationship with Christ unless you're in a body somewhere. It's like a hand just running around, you know, like uh, uh, the Munsters, the thing. You ever see that? Just, uh, just a hand? Or wouldn't it be funny if you're just a nose walking around? You've got to be a part of the local church somewhere. Newsflash, there is no per perfect church. Wherever you are, you will bring imperfection to it. I bring imperfection to it. We all bring imperfection. And then there is the unchurched because they're not believers. And we want to develop a safe environment here for them to come. Look at letter B. Uh, excuse me. Number three, commit to serving the ministry of my CV church by discovering my gifts and talents. This is what our life development 301 is all about. And Kathy is presently teaching that seminar. You discover your God-given shape. Shape stands for S is your spiritual gifts. H is your heart, that is your passion. A is your abilities. P is your personality, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And your experiences, okay? That's how you discern God's will. One of the ways is, how has he shaped me? He's not going to work against your shape. And then look at letter C, by developing a servant's heart. Jesus said this, but among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave. For even the Son of Man came to be served, not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom. And then look at number four. I commit to supporting the testimony in my church three ways and I'm done. A, by attending faithfully. Some of us attend once every four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. What's that? Well, yeah, but you're the pastor. You have to show up. Yeah, I do. But before I was, you asked Kathy. We went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and sometimes we would catch a Friday night. Why? Because we were committed to the local church. Look at this, Hebrews 10, 25. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another. When you're not here, we're broken. 
because we're missing what only you can give. Letter B, by living a godly life. Philippians 127, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, whether I come and see you again or only hear what about you, I know you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. You will make our Sunday morning get-togethers that much more rich when you come prayed up and you come ready to serve. Don't answer this. How many of us come and go, oh, you know, I'm just wiped out. I, I hope he says something that will feed me. I need to be fed. As opposed to, I, you know, I do need something today from God, and I believe you're going to give it to me, but I want to give something away. I want to touch somebody's life so that their life is changed. If you could hear Tanya speak about what it means that she has found a church family for her little boy that's only four. He keeps saying, I want to go back to school. I want to go to that school. He means Sunday school at CV Church. She goes, I've never seen him like this before. Do you think that changes that woman's life? You should see her now. When I, I was walking Costco on Friday, I go every Friday, I heard, Scotty, Scotty. I turned around, there she was. Oh, it's so good to see you. I was hoping you'd come in today. You just don't know how you'll change people's lives. Let her see. By tithing and giving on a regular basis. Deuteronomy 14, 23 says this. The purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your life. Okay, I have gone over my time. I apologize. Jeff, would you welcome Jeff Harrison? Good morning. Is this on? About 27 years ago, I was at church sitting just like you are today, and a man named Bob came up and asked the congregation, want to know what's really changed my life for the better. And I thought to myself in the third person thinking, well, I'm doing good, but I really do want to be better. He went on to share that he got paid on Mondays. And I was like, well, that's kind of weird. Normally people get paid on Fridays. And, but anyway, he, the, the first check that he wrote before he opened his bills was his tithe. He always gave 10% off the top before he spent anything else. So Without seeing his bills, he just wrote his tithe check and just trusted that God was going to provide, that there was going to be enough. He shared this with his wife, and his wife, his wife got wind of this, and she was shocked. However, he had mentioned that she had noticed a change in him and realized that his marriage was better, his relationship with his kids was better, and the opportunities at work were better. Now, I can't tell you what the sermon was on that Sunday, but I can tell you that Bob changed my life forever. I just want to share three things that from 27 years ago of tithing has changed my life. Because, first of all, the first thing is, is that God became first. Because tithing put money in its proper place, and it helped me live like everything is God's. Our house, our wife our kids, our finances, and our time, because they are. Second, my heart changed. Church became my second home, and like my family, I was investing in it. Serving was a choice, not a job. I was a manager, not an owner. A gift or tithe was a gift, or is a gift. No strings attached, and you give joyfully. And then third, Jesus pays back in spades, not a card game. When I connected all of the dots, I could see where belonging, believing, and becoming of what God designed me to be includes tithing to this church. It's the foundational root of God's economy and God's promises to bless us when we tithe. For the spades, the blessings in my life, I met my wife here. 
Our house was prayed over and counseled on. The pregnancy of our twins were prayed over and prophetically taught. The fostering and adopting ministry was birthed here. And out of that, we adopted our daughter, Rosie. Um, my closest true friends are here. Being taught and making corrections in my life every Sunday happens here. And I'll say this twice because it, it really is amazing. There is no other place that I know where these goods and services are provided. There's no other place that I know where these goods and services are provided. As parents, Mindy and I have been teaching our sons to tithe so that they don't have to wait as long as I did to reap God's promises. He has been more than faithful and has blessed us beyond what we have been given, and that is, in economic terms, value over cost, since we can never outgive God. It is your and my past giving um, that has provided the resources for this, the renovations that we're going to be talking about um, at this church, and that we, it's been an ongoing process and journey, and it's what keeps this church functioning financially. As we continue to give, we will continue to see God's move and provide and return the blessings to us. As I like to say, better together. We are in this together, together as one family, and just imagine how blessed we will all be when God uses us to raise $10 million for the next new property. Thanks, Jeff. Well, my name is Rick. I'm the pastor of finance and administration here at CV Church. I'm going to go through the 2017 finances quickly so you won't get bored and so you won't be able to understand what I'm talking about because that's what I call job security. <laughs> if you have any questions, just check with me afterwards and I won't give up until you're thoroughly confused. <laughs> and if you're not thoroughly confused enough now, I'm going to make it even more confusing by digressing just a moment. The annual statement that you were given today isn't correct. We just discovered that uh, it seems like our copier is demon-possessed. It just would not do what we wanted it to. We thought we'd finally solved that problem. It's put the 2017 cover on the 2015 report. So ignore it. Next week, we will have it corrected for you and available. But the numbers that you are about to see on the screen behind me uh, will be accurate. And there is going to be a sheet that you can take on your way out if you're anxious to have them for yourself. So just don't look at this. <laughs> so the next thing I was going to say is please turn to page 13 in your annual report. Don't do that. <laughs> just look at what's on the wall behind me. Our fiscal year runs from July to June. So last June 30th was the end of our 2017 fiscal year. Overall, our finances look very good, as they seem to each and every year. Income rose in line with expenses from year to year, so the bottom line's very similar from year to year. This is good news, and here's why it happened, because you are very generous and giving people, and that's also evidence of God blessing us. God says it's better to give than receive, and when we give, we're going to receive. 2017 was a good year because we're a church that gives and tithes. The word tithe it means 10%. So this church makes sure we give away at least 10% of everything we receive every year. And in 2017, we actually gave away almost 19% of everything that came in. We gave that 19% to good causes locally and around the world. We could do that because we participate God's economy, not the U.S. economy. We trusted God with our tithes and offerings, and he responded. In 2017, the staff and the council managed expenses well, coming in under budget. Besides paying all the bills, throughout the course of the year, we gave away $84,000 to various causes just from operations. That's 5% more than we gave away last year. And we still had $57,000 remaining at the end of the year. So after praying, Pastor Scott and the church council took it on as the responsibility to determine what should be done with that excess. Well, they determined it would be shared among worldwide outreach, a fund to support 2018's increased operational needs, and a reserve fund to replace things as they wear out. 
This fund is like a savings account. We use it to replace things like the roof on the building, the chairs that you're sitting in, office equipment, even the paint on the building, or for campus renovations. We add to this fund every year so that we can replace things as they wear out. I would ask you to turn to page 16 so you can see more detail, but you can do that next time. Next, we want to talk about reserve fund activity. So I want you to note that $57,000 net increase I mentioned earlier, it's being transferred into the reserve fund. From the reserve fund, we spent $31,000 on facility upgrades, repairs, renovations, and replacing or upgrading equipment. And $19,000 that came in for operations was given to various missional purposes. Next, we'll look at what we call designated funds activity. Designated funds is funds that you give for a specific purpose. You gave almost $59,000 for specific designated purposes. Over $29,000 was dispersed to care for people in countries suffering from a disaster and for other missional purposes. Another 11.3,000 help people locally in various ways. And if we combine all of the giving for operations, reserves, and designated funds, our CV Church family came together and gave away $153,000, or 19% of all the funds we received last fiscal year. So to summarize, we give to our denomination. We give to missions. We give to people who are hurting and in trouble. We give because God has given us so much. And we still ended the year with more than we started with, and that's been happening the entire 25 years Pastor Scott and Kathy have been here. It really is better to give than receive. And God's responding to our faithful giving. And it's your giving that funds the five purposes Pastor Scott was talking about and God's vision for our future, which helps us bring, brings us together as one. We've hired gifted and talented people to help us accomplish those five purposes, and they help us come together. And they serve our volunteers who also help us come together. And we've committed financial resources to support all of them. It really is amazing how much you are all willing to do to serve and to give from your time and your talents and your tithes. Being giving people doesn't mean you're going to end up with less. Not when God's involved. When God's involved, you're giving and investing in his kingdom. And that's like planting a seed. We plant seeds so we can expect to reap a harvest, a great harvest. In this case, a harvest of people becoming whole through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, that's the past and the present. Now, let's look at the future for our facilities. CV Church started in 1952, so we're celebrating our 65th year. And that group met in the Legion Hall next door. If you look at carefully at this picture that was taken 60 years ago, those of you that know, go back, please. Back up, back up. Can we go back? More technical difficulties. One more. A 28-year-old Marvin Osherman is standing right there. And for those of you who are familiar with Christian Assembly and even younger, Pastor Mark Pickerel is right in this group of kids. Our first building was that next slide you saw, and it was right on the corner out here. This building we're in right now replaced it in 1961, and we re began re renovating this 60-year-old building in 2003. Since then, seating, sound, lighting, audio, and video were updated, but some of those are in need of additional attention now. The children's space upstairs was renovated in 2009. The restrooms were done in 2012. The next picture you see is our epic youth and multipurpose building. It was originally built in 1900. So we gutted it and renovated it in 2010, and it's in great shape in the inside now. And then the nursery building, it was built in 1910. Children really matter to us, so it was completely renovated in 2006 and again in 2016. Now it's time to focus back on this building. Part of pursuing being together as one is appealing to a broader range of people. Having facilities that are comfortable, inviting, safe, aesthetically pleasing and eye-catching is really essential to accomplishing that. People have actually told us they've driven by for here for years and never noticed there was a church here, or they thought it was a rest home. 
the changes we want to make, I reject that, even if I looked apart. The changes we want to make help us stop being the invisible church in some very visible ways. It starts with prayer. And that led to a plan for some very practical changes. This next picture is how we want to redesign what we want to accomplish on the outside. Now, if you've been here for a while, you'll recall we first told you about this two years ago. Since then, to be honest, we've run into a number of very unexpected challenges. We had to redesign the outside twice. The city of Glendale didn't like the appearance of the first, and the second turned out to be too expensive to build. Then, when we submitted our final plans to the city of Glendale, it generated 30 pages of corrections. Not 30 corrections, 30 pages of corrections. We're still working through those, but to put it simply, while the city approved the building we're in in 1961, there's no way they would approve it today. We have a one-story building attached to a two-story building. If we want to make changes to it, then we're going to have to add fire sprinklers and a firewall to this building. We're exploring how to do that and make sure that we can afford it. Delays can be frustrating if we allow them to. But delays, just like the things we worry about, are also actually opportunities to seek God, pray for him to help us, and see how he responds. It's really amazing to see who God sent us to resolve the problems we face. We have had two architects volunteer time to change our plans and meet with the city. Ng and Robert Jones are new to our church. They're project managers, and their help has been invaluable. John Buss has helped us with electrical. It's clear God's still in control, even if the timing of our renovations isn't quite what we thought it would be. While we're working on the fire sprinkler issues, here's what we believe we can do now. First, we're going to add an electrical panel on the wall right outside the closet here to your right. We'd originally been told that would cost us thirty dollars to $40,000 to accomplish. The people I mentioned that are helping us helped us figure out how to get it down to a much more reasonable $6,000 range. Then, we're going to plan on replacing the air conditioner that sits on the roof here also to your right. Those of you who feel it's too cold sitting over here will be very glad to know it's going to end up in the wall behind me. Pastor Scott and the worship team will also be glad because it does get hot under the lights. Next, we intend to make changes to the stage and the decor inside. Some upgrades to lighting, sound, and floor coverings could follow that, and perhaps even repaving the parking lot. We think all of that can happen while we resolve the issue of the fire sprinklers and then go back to city to have our final plans approved. We're praying that that can happen by the end of this year. Next, you're looking at the Friendship Terrace. We may end up building this gazebo-like structure first if the approvals for this building continue to drag on. The Friendship Terrace will be built just west of the building we're in right now, where we gather for special events like the one we're having today. Once it's finished, we'll regularly dismiss services out the back door over here and only use the front doors to enter for services. That'll also improve traffic flow. The Friendship Terrace is going to be a comfortable, safe, and inviting alternative to standing out in the front in the parking lot dodging cars. It'll be a safe place to bring your friends and family members to hang out without concern for moving cars or a crowd of people trying to get inside for the next service. It's you. It's all of you that make CV Church a safe place to come to. These renovations will help you and us widen the path for people to come together here and experience just how great it is to be part of our family and to get to know Jesus Christ personally. We estimate the cost of the renovations is going to be somewhere between $250,000 and $300,000. And the really good news is we have the funds on deposit, so we don't need to borrow or fundraise to do this. If our members vote to reaffirm in favor, we will ask our denomination for approval and submit the plans to the city for approval. Once they get approved, we put them out to bid. We hope to start that phase in January or February and construction by, perhaps by April of 2018. Now, in addition to voting on these renovations, in a few minutes you'll be voting for church council members. Pastor Scott, do you want to say anything else or should we go right on to that? All right. Would the ushers please come and distribute the ballots? I'm looking for... If, uh, you know if you're a member because you've been through Life Development 101 and you've signed that commitment. So if that's you, would you raise your hand so we can get the... Uh, so we can get this to you. So the important things to know, as Pastor Scott has repeated, 
nobody is competing against anybody else. You just vote yes or no for the council members on the list if you're a member. Please make sure you turn it over. That's where you get to vote regarding the renovations. So go ahead and do that. And as soon as you're finished filling them out, just pass them to the end of the row, and a, an usher will pick them up. And with that, I'd like to invite Pastor Kathy to come up and share a few things with you. Thanks for your time. So four years ago at the Vision Day, just like this, I had the real privilege and joy of introducing to you uh, well, and saying to you that Joel Simpson was going to be the worship leader. I don't know if you remember that. And uh, we were all excited. And um, he had been working here for three years before that, but then it was time. And, and so, so that was really exciting. Then, as if you're a guest, um, this would be new news to you, but, that, but it, it has been in this month that Joel has shared with everybody that he is going to be uh, leaving, and he lives in Whittier, and it's too far for him, and there's just lots of reasons that he's shared. So we need to, so we've been praying, obviously, about, so what next, Lord? And um, the one thing that I would say to you is we do not feel like we are replacing Joel. No one can replace Joel. We love Joel. Um, but God is good, and he's not leaving us high and dry, and he's not leaving Joel high and dry either. So he has good things. In fact, God reminded me this morning he's extravagantly good. I mean, it's good. How do you say that? His goodness is extravagant. So that's a comfort to me. So he's going to do something wonderful while we are figuring out what that is, who that is, how that is, God has answered us with someone that I am very honored to introduce to you. Someone, the reason this is, is so um, deeply, deeply touching to all of us, I know, is because this person who's going to be leading us in this next season, and when I say leading, I don't even mean leading like Joel leading. I mean, it's going to be like the head worship leader, like the head leader of worship. I don't know how else to say this. Um, this person, so it's interesting. Four years ago, Joel became the worship leader. Four years ago, this person started really severely struggling with their health. And in this season, has sought God and I happen to respect this person very much. I have seen her seek God like no one I know. There is a depth to her life that has come because of her pain. And I so respect how she has gone through this. And I trust her leadership. And so it's my privilege to introduce to you Whitney Wood. All right. Well, I'll keep this brief because I don't enjoy public speaking, but I'm not supposed to say that. So I love public speaking. I'm excited. Um, <laughs> yes. Well, so I am very sad about Joel leaving, but I also know that change can be difficult and hard. But it's um, when I think back in my life of the really hard times where I had to change, that's when my character was tested and that's when I grew. So I know, as she said, I know that um, there's going to be a lot of growth for us. So just really quickly, um, I'm just excited. I really want um, our team and myself to be someone that follows the Holy Spirit's direction. I know when um, when change happens, it can be new and exciting, and there's like a lot of things that I keep having all these ideas. I'm definitely like a dreamer and a vision visionary. Um, but I want to be somebody who sticks to, you know, what God's dreams are for here at our church. So um, I'm just excited for that. And then as well, I'm just excited for all um, our leaders that we have on the worship team and in our department. I'm just really excited to kind of have more people step up. There's some really awesome people that are involved um, 
in our creative team and on our worship team. So I'm just excited to see a lot of more people step up um, and just take take more charge um, and more responsibility of their worship team. So that'll be cool. Um, I'm really excited to just focus on community um, in our worship de department. I'm excited to just um, have new opportunities for us to be sharing with each other what's going on in our lives, what God is doing in our lives, because um, I think that's so important as a team for us to be, you know, spiritually yoked, because as we prepare to lead you guys on Sunday mornings, it's so important that we have a depth with each other of what God is doing in our life. And then um, spiritual maturity is something I'm, you know, myself, I'm working on, and I'm just excited as, as we focus more on that as a team as well as you know our whole church focusing on spiritual maturity and and our understanding of worship and just continuing to grow because there's always something to learn we're never not you know we never don't have anything to learn about worship and how God wants to move in worship so um, with that we do have worship night tonight which we're super excited about um, if you haven't been, it's a super exciting time just to have an extended amount of time in worship. Um, it's Joel's last worship night, so if you haven't been able to make one and you want to soak up, you know, your little last last time with him, it's, I'm sure we're just all going to cry the whole time, if I'm being honest. Um, and then as well, we're having... Um, I really wanted to go and help out with um, the hurricane relief, but I just know with, with all my stuff right now, I'd be more of a liability than a help. So my um, calling has been to help um, send a team out there. So um, if you guys are interested, if you, yeah, you can email me, winnie.wood at cvchurch.com. Um, we're looking at the end of October. And so tonight at worship night, we're going to take if we're not going to take, we're going to receive a love offering for um, the team that we're going to create to send out there. If for some reason we don't get enough people that want to go, then we'll just, we'll send the money to the relief um, team out there already. We won't keep it or not do anything. So um, either way, it will be, it will be sent to Harvey. But yeah, so email me if you're interested. Thank you. I want to close our time uh, together in prayer. Father, we're, uh, we're deeply moved by your love and your care for us and for this world, for you so loved that you gave your only son. And Father, you were willing to give Jesus, and Jesus, you were willing to come because you were committed to us. So Lord, I ask that what has been shared today will go deep into each one of our hearts, that we would be willing to look at where are those areas where we have not been committed and to repent of that, and to ask you to forgive us for being aloof and for procrastinating and for, thinking, for getting our feelings hurt so that we don't engage. Lord, we, we want to protect the unity that you have given your life for here at CV Church. Lord, we want to partner in the responsibility. Father, we want to cooperate in the testimony of our church. And we want to be able to give of our time and our talents and our treasure and our time. So we thank you for this time in Jesus' name.